Welcome to Between Baghdad and Haifa, a conference that pays tribute to Israeli author Sami Michael, sitting with us in the front row. My name is Barry Wimfeimer, and I direct the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies here at Northwestern. The Crown Family Center put this conference together in partnership with the Hechsherim Institute for Jewish and Israeli Literature and Culture at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. I'd like to thank the two co-chairs of the conference, Eli Reches of Northwestern and Yigal Schwartz of Ben Gurion for their vision and their work in putting this together. We are, in, we are all in their debt. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the conference co-sponsors, the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, whose new dean, Adrian Randolph, is here, and I will introduce in a few minutes, uh, the Israel Institute, the Buffett Institute for Global Studies at Northwestern, the Kaplan Institute for the Humanities at Northwestern, the Comparative Literary Studies Program of the Weinberg College, and the Middle East and North African Studies Program of the Weinberg College. But I just want to say we're proud here at Northwestern University to have the Crown Center. We're proud to have people like Barry and others and Ellie who, who put their heart and soul into it. Uh, and it's a great atmosphere. And there's nothing better than bringing great people from all over the world to get together and learn from each other. And that, I know, is what you're going to do for the next two days. And I'm really sorry I'm going to miss it. Thank you. Uh, we are actually really honored. That the, uh, that the new dean of Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, Adrian Randolph, is with us tonight. Um, last year, Northwestern conducted a uh, national and international search to find a replacement to be our new dean, and we couldn't be more delighted that the search committee found uh, Adrian Randolph. He hasn't been here for more than uh, a couple months, but already in my interactions with him, I've been very impressed, not only with his smarts, and his political know-how, but more importantly with his accent. So without further ado, Adrian Randolph. I'm delighted to be here. And I do have a few comments. I've always enjoyed opening events. Uh, I've always thought it to be a really exciting moment. Uh, it's always difficult uh, to work through the complex ideas in a conference or a gathering to stay attentive for so long. And so the beginning is always that moment of excitement before the difficulty, frankly, of working through all the ideas. And that's not to say the interventions won't be wonderful and sparkling, uh, but I really think uh, this is a moment of potential and I always enjoyed uh, these celebratory moments. So without further ado, let me just say a few remarks. They won't be long, don't worry. Uh, and then we'll get on to the uh, center of the evening. What is a neighbor? As recent scholarship across many disciplines has demonstrated, the seemingly innocuous term, neighbor, hides a deep and roiling discourse about our responsibility to the proximate being, the individual, the individuals, or groups with whom we share something in common, but without the necessity of intimacy. The extraordinary Sami Michael asks us to probe the nature of our neighborliness, our responsibility to those with whom we share something, usually space, in a way that accounts for ethical difficulties and tensions. His intercultural sensitivity surely derives from his own cultural history and affinities, about which we shall hear more, I'm sure, in the coming interventions. So I shall not embarrass myself or you by trying to delve more deeply into these matters. I will say this. We are grateful to the organizers of this event, the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern and Ben Yorion University, as well as the participants for joining us in shedding light on the work of award-winning author and activist, Sami Michel. I thought it appropriate to begin with some words from the author himself. They are, I think, a far better introduction than I can aspire to offer. So here is a brief excerpt, one that uh, struck me in reading some of uh, Michel's work, uh, uh, from A Trumpet in the Wadi, originally published in 1987 and here in a translation by Yael Lotan. The narrator and protagonist, Huda, and this is towards the end of the novel, relates her mingled feelings as a Christian Arab living in Israel on the brink of war. And I quote, then I saw the war rolling through Independence Street. I had linked my fate to a Jew, but my fears were still those of an Arab. I didn't dare to stop and ask the worried-looking passers-by what was happening. 
I was sure that they would know me for what I am. I felt I was walking like an Arab, looking around like an Arab, thinking like an Arab. The men on the pavement were gazing with Jewish eyes at sons and brothers, husbands and fathers, being led to fight a Jewish war. My alienness intensified with every step. My legs turned boneless. I reminded myself that Alex, her husband, was a Jew, but what came to mind were some Arabic lullabies from my early childhood. Then suddenly they disappeared, leaving me blank, neither Jew nor Arab, in a street that was a solid mass of anxiety and fear, hatred and anger. In this war-minded street, the Jews might let me share their laughter, but not their sorrow, whereas the Arabs would eject me from their laughter, but expect me to participate in their sorrow. End of citation. Now, the evocation of disidentification and re-identification is central to the unfolding narrative, and it also captures, I think, some of the intellectual and intercultural complexity at the heart of so many troubles and beauties in today's world. And it is one we address here at Northwestern. Our vision here is one of intellectual, social, and cultural diversity. And the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, home to the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, cherishes and nourishes breadth, empathy, and understanding, especially when it comes to cross-cultural understanding. We grapple intensely with the notion of neighborliness that underwrites issues of proximity, identification, and possibly the intimacy that runs through what I have read of Sami Michel's work. We are therefore gratified and deeply honored to host Sami Michel at this conference, examining his writings. So thanks very, very much to the efforts of the organizers, including Igor Schwartz, Ellie Rekas, and Barry Wimpheimer, director of the Crown Family Center. We are all in your debt. Mark Twain once said that life would be infinitely happier if we could only be born at the age of 80 and gradually approach 18. <laughs> this quote, no doubt the inspiration for F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which became a movie. You may have heard about it. It won some awards. Uh, occurred to me frequently as I was reading Sammy Michael's latest novel, his 15th by my count, entitled Yahalom Min Shimon, Diamond from the Wilderness, published in Hebrew in 2015. Yahalom and Shimon is a book written by a writer who is nearly 90 and describes the love story of two adolescents, teenagers, in 1930s Baghdad. Kamal, the male hero, is the only son of a relatively wealthy Iraqi Jewish family named Irani. Almasa, the female heroine, is an abused girl adopted into the Irani household as a maid. The vivid descriptions of physical buildings, social institutions, customs and ways of thinking in this book provide a tremendous window into a vanished world, the world of Iraqi Jews under King Faisal I. Michael uses the wisdom of age to reflect wonderfully and insightfully on teenage infatuation and sexuality within a cultural context that was the author's own in childhood but is now very far in the past. The book is shockingly rich in subtly drawn female characters and surprisingly explicit for its depiction of sex within a traditional Jewish community in a traditional Muslim society. And uh, it's not translated into English yet, but I hope that it will be because it's really good reading. Um, sadly, I will confess that I had not heard of Sami Michael, our guest of honor, until this conference was scheduled, which is really much to my shame. In the months leading up to this conference, I have had the opportunity to visit Israel and ask others. Everyone with whom I spoke was familiar with Michael, and his writing, and was shocked to learn of my own ignorance. When I entered a Jerusalem Stymatsky, that's the big bookstore chain in Israel, for those who don't know, and inquired about purchasing a novel by Sami Michael, I expected to have to navigate my way to a back bookcase and find something shelved alphabetically under author. To my delight, the clerk asked if I wanted Michael's latest. And there it was, on the shelf, on the front table, with a sticker marking it as new. Since reading the excellent novel, which more than holds its own among the Hebrew novels I've read, I've puzzled over my own ignorance. How is it that I had never come across this author or his writing? I'm still open to suggestions, but I think that it likely has something to do with Sami Michael's cultural position as an Iraqi Jew in Israel. For those of you who don't know, Israeli high culture, 
like much of Israeli politics and economics, was long dominated by Ashkenazic Jews, Jews from Christian lands. In my own genealogy, the big divide between East and West is between Poland and Germany, Eastern European Ashkenazic Jews and Western European Ashkenazic Jews. Academics who work on literature have also historically been biased towards Ashkenazic writers. In recent years, though, Mizrahi Jews, including Jews from Iraq, have begun to receive their due. Since his first novel, All Men Are Equal But Some Are More, what a great title, All Men Are Equal But Some Are More, set in the transit camps of immigrants to Israel in the 1950s, Michael has been an eloquent spokesman about the social and economic gaps that separate groups in Israel. In addition to his writings, Michael has been politically active for his entire life, whether as a communist writer in the 1950s or an arbitrator for the Israeli Supreme Court in the 1980s. His oppositional stance has sometimes made him less celebrated than other writers who have promoted a less cloudy depiction of Israeli society. It is an honor for us at Northwestern to celebrate this distinguished writer. It wasn't just Twain's dream of 80 to 18 that reminded me of Twain. In reading the latest novel, I found myself struck by this work that combines a romance with a coming of age story. The male hero, Kamal, is a bit like Huckleberry Finn in the way that he floats around the roofs of Baghdad, living an exciting life unsupervised by adults and with companions like his uncle Baruch, Baruch, a slow-witted man of no letters who manages to give Kamal the sexual education he cannot get elsewhere. At times, Kamal is also a bit like Holden Caulfield of Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, overcome by the occasional philosophical impulse and sometimes walking the streets to gain the space to process a changing adolescent world. Now that I've discovered Sammy Michael's writing, I can't wait to read his earlier work. For those of you with background in Israel, Benny Tzifer needs no introduction. Tzifer is an author and journalist who has served as the literary editor of the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz since 1988. Haaretz, for those in the audience who do not know, can best be described as the New York Times of Israel if the Times were written by the staff of the New Yorker. What I mean to say is that this is a daily newspaper that is the leading periodical of critical cultural reception in Israel. And the literary editor plays a major role in determining what cultural production will be received and how it will be received. Sifer, I should mention, also has Mizrahi background. His parents immigrated to Israel from Turkey, where his grandfather, I discovered, founded the world's first Jewish sports team in Istanbul. Go Cubs. A longtime provocateur in Israel, Sifer has specialized in writing and saying controversial things. With any luck, he has something special in store for us tonight. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Sami Michael and Benny Sifer. Sami Michael is for me first and above all the ultimate non-conformist of Israeli culture. As a writer, as a social activist, as an Israeli and as a Jew. And Sami Michael paid a heavy price for that non-conformism. And uh, this conference, uh, I think, uh, or at least the, uh, the question we will talk about, ask and answer, uh, will deal with this impossibility of Israeli literature to embrace what we call the other. And I think it's the main, uh, let's say, problem of Israeli literature and the, the main answer, the main originality of Sami Michael is that he is the, perhaps the only one who can feel the other and can answer the other. Um, and this uh, homage to Sami that uh, this conference is honoring one of Israel's most important writers is taking place here some thousands of miles away from Israel where Sami is still, after six decades of writing, a kind of outcast. We shouldn't forget that too. And this is exactly one of the paradoxes that makes the phenomenon called Sami Michael such a fascinating phenomenon because Sami is of those spectacular victims of the misunderstanding engraved in the what we call the hard disk of Israeli culture. He's one of these cases who cause problems 
to those responsible for putting in order in literature. So in what drawer is Tami Michael going to fit? This drawer hasn't yet been found or invented. So what and who is Sami Michael? Born in Iraq, meaning Mizrahi, what we say, and also left-wing activist, ex-communist, and intellectual. Oh dear, too complicated. Too complicated. We Israelis cannot stand people who resist stereotypes. And the Mizrahis are supposed to be, as we know, right-wing and to lack any kind of sophistication. So that person called Sami Michael should be punished for the headache that he is causing us. So uh, now to the questions. The first question, Sami, is I know you for being quite a practical person in life and realistic. Yeah, when we talk and we, you explain to me the situ political situation, etc. So tell me, how come you are so naive? <laughs> <laughs> I beg your like. pardon for my poor English. Uh, while being in Iraq, my first, uh, my reading language was uh, English, but living in Israel for m nearly 70 years, uh, I, the English became poor and poor. But I will try to explain myself. Uh, you call me how I am naive. Also my grandchildren call me, Grandpapa, you are very naive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the child of uh, uh, Henderson, who said that the king is nude, he is very naive, yeah. so that uh, I prefer to be that child yeah. than the sophisticated uh, uh, liar uh, the, uh, who is uh, not, not naive. Uh, I, I really try every day to defend this naiveness of mine, to still believe that the man in his soul is pure, that we are human beings and not wolves eating each, each other. If 1941, yeah, during the Second World War, when thousands and thousands of cities were burned, millions were killed, if someone said at that time that the, the will a time come when uh, a French can go to Germany without passport, they use the same money, they wouldn't kill a, say he is naive. They will kill him for, yeah. for his naiveness. <laughs> uh, so that I say I am lucky that, that they, 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 I live in an era that they don't kill the naive person like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, to my opinion, as I said before, I consider you personally, but not only me, as the ultimate other uh, in Hebrew literature. And, the, uh, and I mean now, uh, literally, uh, or in the, on the style mode, Israeli literature of your generation was mainly preoccupied with, um, with the figure, let's say, I will, I will say in a very general way, of Kafka. Kafka was the model. He was the, the one who, who served as a, as a major source of influence to, uh, to writers because Israeli literature of your generation was aim, aimed to educate people, to give them allegories about life, about how they, sh how they should behave, how they should think, give them tools to think. And you came out of nowhere with a literature that is mainly realistic, meaning 
telling what reality is without make, putting it in a mask of alleg allegorical, uh, let's say, decoration. Do you accept this uh, analysis? Partly. Okay. <laughs> I think that uh, going in the path of Kafka and also to postmodernism, it is a kind of fleeting the uh, meeting the reality as it is. It, I think that it is natural. You, you, you can do it. You have the right to do it. Uh, but I, I live in the Middle East, and I can't go on dreaming, uh, trying with, to, to deal with only with Kafka and postmodernism, because the, if you are not realist in the Middle East, you will be smashed, killed, forgotten. So that in, in the Middle East, uh, you, you have to live with not only two eyes, six eyes, with four ears to defend th the values that you live uh, th th for. Um, so that well, I am a realist, yes, I am a realist. I a dreamer, yes, I a dreamer. If I, have an, an, if I am naive, I yes. Uh, uh, I am naive, but uh, but when I take in um, uh, at ten o'clock my uh, a glass of coffee, cup of coffee, go uh, to the writing room, uh, close the door behind me, I am really don't know what I am. <laughs> I didn't feel the, my body at that time. I don't know. I am going on the path of Kafka, or, or the path of the child who said the king is nude. I, I, this is what, you know, the spring of water, he doesn't know that he's spring. So that I don't know uh, what I am while writing. Sometimes when I read what I uh, wrote w one day before, I said, who is the foolish wrote so rubbish things? <laughs> Sometimes uh, when I read what I wrote the day before, I say, wow, someone else wrote it. <laughs> uh, so that yeah. trying to classify uh, and put me, uh, you are uh, that, although I don't know. I am, am. I am. It is the, your problem, not my problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> uh, Israeli literature usually or always had ve many difficulties dealing with Arab characters in literature, and yeah. also in life, but uh, let's uh, stick yeah, to literature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it it was always tr uh, treated either through idealization of the Arab or condensation. And you were, in fact, this I think is a, your major and really ultimate contribution and first contribution to, to literature is the fact that you are the first to describe in, uh, in your, in the novel, especially in Hasud, Arabs, real Arabs as they are, as they are. Can you, can you reply to that or, or enlarge the, the, a bit about it? Because I am myself half Arab. <laughs> I left it, Iraq at the age of 22 as a patriotic Iraqi Arab. We, lo we, we not only talk Arabic language, but we um, um, uh, were part of the language. We created with the, Arab, the, language, uh, the Arabic language. We, we talked to the Jewish community in Iraq in an ancient Arabic which was used at the uh, Middle Ages. While the Arabs of today in, in Iraq uh, speak the Arabic of Saudi. So that I myself Arab, when I write uh, about Arabs, I, I, I am the, the, the part of Arab part inside of me. When I write about the Israelis, I am 
the, the, part, the Israeli part right, right, take the uh, task of writing. Um, so that so it but can you react to, the, to, to what I said about the, uh, the impossibility of other Israeli writers to write in that way on the Arabs? Do you have any reaction to that, uh, of this it is, incapability? It is, you know, uh, at least I can say that it is a, a problem of ignorance. The, we, Jews and Arabs inside Israel, living sometimes in the same uh, place, in the same cities. But the, the, the Jews, they really don't nothing about, about the Arab, what, th what the Arab thinking. I wouldn't say the name of the Jewish uh, prominent writer. He said, I have a dream. And what is the dream is at night to sleep under the bed of Arab family to hear how, what they think. I don't need to do that. <laughs> I am on the bed, <laughs> not <laughs> under the bed. <laughs> yeah. Um. The, you are you are an exception. I want. I, I would like to to emphasize the fact that you are really an exception, lit in in a, in literary in Israeli literature of your generation, but not only of your generation. Maybe the later, ma but, but let me ask the question. Yes. First. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the fact that I I Israeli literature went more and more toward minimalistic writing. Minimalistic writing became the, uh, the big thing in, is, in Israel, in Israeli literature. And you, from the beginning, you resisted to minimalism. You always wrote a, in a very colorful, very, let's say, realistic, in this opposed to all this minimalism fashion. What, what do you have to Many say? Many dear, I have to clear a point on the other. <laughs> when I came to Israel, I didn't know Hebrew. I came with the language of the enemy. I came with the heritage of the enemy. I came as, uh, uh, from, uh, from Iraq we, uh, finding an, an, an another uh, reality, uh, and uh, my uh, and this, and uh, I started to study you, study the the, uh, the Israeli uh, society, and I come to the conclusion, as a citizen of the Middle Middle East, that the most of the Israelis know nothing, nearly nothing about where they are living, that is the Middle East. And I came to the decision, which I am still uh, living with it, to establish a state of one man, and that is me. <laughs> so, that, so that I am not interested so much what are the, what the, other Jewish writes, wrote, write about the Arabs. I have my uh, personal path, I have my personal uh, literature, and I, am, uh, I was so happy then they asked uh, in one of the meetings an Arab writer what you think about the state of Sami Mikhail. <laughs> and he said, I want to be ambassador there. <laughs> So that I, I, I really don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I respect what the others write, but it is for me, it is another reality. In that reality, I, I, uh, I, I am independent. Yeah, so independent I, perhaps I'll read reality. something you said, I just yes. read it loud. Um, you said, Israeli literature is a market with many stands for many writers. I didn't want to open a stand in that market. I opened my own in the middle of the street. Yeah. 
So that wasn't the question. That was just. It's a the, 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 uh, you yeah. know, uh, really, I, this is a strange thing which surprised me that so many people uh, buy, buy, the, buy the, my books. <laughs> uh, books which is, uh, belong to a state of one man, <laughs> yeah. a school in literature of one man. But still, I wanted to ask you what were the books? That inspire when you. What were the books that you read when you were in, still in Iraq? The, the books that influenced you. It's the same because books because that my feeling is, is that the literature you read was different from the literature that other right, Israeli writers read. Totally. Yeah. Totally so what different. did you read? Totally different. Well, this is my question. teachers were the teachers of the 19th and 17th and 20th. Uh, uh, prominent writers, universal writers, uh, English literature, French literature, Russian li literature. They, this, these were my teachers in, 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 li in literature. At, at uh, the 50, uh, 1950, uh, the Arab countries in the Middle East and also the Jews inside uh, Israel wrote mainly uh, poetry, not prose, so that not in Arab language and not in Hebrew language I have um, uh, uh, teaching uh, or uh, uh, I, I would say influence of literature uh, of them. They, 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 they wrote mainly uh, poetry. Yeah. I, am, I, I didn't want to be a poet. I am not a poet. So that my teachers were outsiders, who, and I still, they are my teachers. Yeah. And I try to go in their path. Yes. I have to, to it's half a question, just a remark, that Sami Mikhail, for those who don't know, was an exception also from the fact that people of, of uh, his generation, the other writers, began mainly as writers of long short stories. Amos Oz, Aleph Bet Yoshua. They, they didn't begin immediately with novels, while you, Sami Mikhail, immediately began with this kind of novels that are well constructed, well built, with an architecture, you know how to tell a story for a novel. Not, not, it's not a long, uh, uh, let's say, a short story that is taken and uh, they artificially made into a novel. It is uh, due to the fact that my teachers were good. <laughs> not I am. That my teachers were very yeah. good. Yeah. You are, between others, not only a writer, but you are also a public figure and uh, an activist, uh, you did a lot. And, but, so uh, tell me briefly if it's, you don't think it's a waste of time uh, to, to be a, you know, an activist or is it part of the writing? It enriches your writing. One Israeli uh, writer says, that Adam uh, oh, sure, shut. Uh, uh, said that if I don't write literature, he means, I regard it as dead man. No. Besides writing, I am a very living person. I love a, I love a beauty. <laughs> I love my wife. I, 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 I love to live. Yeah, I am a, a simple person, so that I have many activities. I even li like to, uh, to uh, poker, uh, I, I like to fish, I, I like, so I engage in so many activities. One of them is the noble thing to defend my brothers, if women and uh, men. Yeah. So that I have a, a, a really a full yeah. day, I am at the age of, uh, of um, 89 years, nearly 10, uh, uh, 90 years, but I feel on the other side like, like a, a naive child and, and on the other side I feel as if I, I'm already living 
300 years. <laughs> because I, I have been in Iraq, I enjoy, enjoyed every minute there, and I am living in Israel, I'm so happy in Israel. That's, that's uh, really bad what you say, because uh, usually writers, when they can't address public, they say how they suffer, how they write all day, <laughs> and, and they tell their, their, yeah, their misery. No, 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 no. I am you're saying you're happy. I'm a happy you're person. You're betraying happy, your profession. I am a happy person, happy husband, happy writer. Happy, happy, uh, I, I, I am smile even when I go to sleep, I smile when I open my eyes in the morning. Okay, so let's go to the... Uh, yeah. So... I, th I think, I think I, it is, it, maybe it is not so good of that because uh, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I couldn't be Kafka. That is a problem for me. Yeah, you are anti-Kafka for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so now also uh, if we are talking about Kafka but also of others, yeah. W the women characters, yeah. you are, I really, I think that it's, uh, it's not uh, me who said it, but uh, a French writer, never, never mind who he is, yes. that the most difficult task for a writer, a male writer, is to describe, a, to, to create a real character of a woman, to enter into a woman and to be able to tell her that, let's say, Flaubert, did it in uh, Madame Bovary, but Balzac couldn't do it, and he looked it very in a stereotype way on women, etc., etc. And you are, I think, the most elaborate writer, Israeli writer, who succeeded writing from the mouth of a woman, and not only in in Hatzutra Bavadi, Trumpet in the Wadi. You also you took not only a woman, but an Arab Christian woman, and you talk on her behalf and you do it very naturally. So how come? But before you answer, I, I say, again, I'll quote you. Um, uh, once you were asked about it, and you say, I simply love the other. And you say that uh, uh, when I wrote a trumpet in the wadi, I almost grew breasts. <laughs> yeah, so, so could you react to that? You know, my grandfather abused very much the, uh, the, the feminine side. He, he said, like most of the um, reactionary people, they think that the, the women have half a brain. And uh, I, I, I liked all the time to tease him. Uh, he has a workshop on the main street in Baghdad. And I said, Grandpa, uh, Grandpa, uh, see the look at the uh, cars. They are uh, old cars and uh, new cars. The new cars, they are, they are not only new because the industry of uh, automobiles, every year they m make them more sophisticated, uh, more modern, more, uh, so God, when he uh, 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 created Adam, he was uh, happy with him, but he think that something wrong with him, <laughs> so that the women is the most, like the industry of, uh, of uh, cars, it created something more uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. effective, more. Uh, yeah. the, the he was angry elaborate. with that. Yeah. I do still think that the women are. But how did you uh, uh, succeed to enter in the uh, character? I, I, of I, I am like the water. You, you, the water is two part uh, atoms of uh, hydrogen and one atom of. Um, if uh, uh, oxygen, uh, so that I, I am the drop of the water. I am, the, I am uh, at the same time a man and a woman. <laughs> so I feel. Yeah. And uh, I have to, to, to confess that I was the naive, I was also the um, terrible child, and um, 
the male side of the family wanted to, to, to secure me, uh, and the girls, the women in the big house defended me, so that I owe so much <laughs> to, the, the, to the women, to the girls who defended me all the way. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to live in a world without the, what the, the other side give us, yeah. that is the women. Yeah. So now, now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that an experience of mine and then we'll continue on the other clip. Uh, that, so on my, one of my visits to Jordan, now I'm, I'm not reading sides me, okay? Uh, my, my visit to Jordan, I met a couple, Iraqis, non-Jews, uh, who live as refugees in Jordan. In one of our conversations, the woman said that every time she wants to remember Iraq, she reads Victoria. I was amazed. It was there in a, in a villa in, a, in Amman. Uh, she reads Victoria by Sami Michael. You left Iraq so many years ago, and yet you can describe Iraq in such a vivid way that even people who just recently left there, like this, uh, cu this couple, can find it uh, trustworthy. And uh, of course I'm referring to Aida that takes place in the time of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. And, uh, and you weren't there. So how, how come? You know, I left, uh, as I said, Iraq at the uh, age of 22. My childness, boyness, even as a young man, were there. I didn't uh, burn them. The, the memories are still with, him, with me. My childness is still there. So I said in, um, to audience in, uh, Iraqi audience in, in Sofia last month that I have two mothers, biological mother and adapting mother. My ad uh, biological mother is Iraqi, in Iraq, Iraq, and the adapting mother is Israel. I, I, I am belong to the both sides, so it isn't difficult for me to go back and to say to the, uh, to say that Iraq, and especially the Jewish Iraqi, are part of me. I can't uh, um, forget uh, when, when I meet Iraqi refugees, not Jews, Muslims and the Christians, it took me only three seconds, then we embraced uh, uh, each other, like, like refugees who live there, the same cradle, the same uh, river, the same food, the same memories in Iraq. Yeah, and still uh, the, I'm, I'm asking you, how could you uh, figure out what is going on in Iraq in, on, in Saddam Hussein time when you weren't there and it comes out as if you were there, as if you were writing. So how, how did you know what is I going don't on know. there? I don't, I, I, I don't know. I really I don't know why, how I am a writer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Really, I don't know. I, do, I don't know the, the, the part of the brain which is uh, works, which is right. I don't uh, write before, beforehand what I am going. I don't uh, write a plan or a sketch of, of uh, the novel. I, I said when I close the door, start to, to, to write, I don't feel even my bodies. I th the, the, the feel, my feeling is as if one standing behind me and is telling what to write. I really don't know. So, yeah, there's so many things that I don't know what happens inside my mind while I am writing. Yeah. I am a woman, I am a man, I'm Iraqi and a Jewish. Uh, and I, at the same time, uh, before three years, I was um, called to, to 
a conference which organized by the uh, Pope, Homne Banglit, Fior, Pope, uh, under the, uh, uh, the subject that uh, religion and, um, and um, uh, peace. Uh, and I, I took part uh, in the last session, and uh, the cardinal who was uh, uh, sitting there he said, till now, I, according to your name, we don't know if you are Jew and a Christian. On the first um, row of seats, there was an Ayatollah from Iran. I, I really, I was afraid of him. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to, to talk. And this, the, the sentence of the cardinal uh, inspired me to start the, my speech by saying, I am trying to be a good Jew, and at the same time I am trying to be a, a, a good Christian and a good Muslim. <laughs> and so I developed my spirit. When I gained the, went down, I think that I saw the Ayatollah coming uh, with uh, arms like that, he became three times his volume. I, I, I thought that, that he going to attack me. He embraced me. <laughs> uh, I said, Allah barak fi, God bless you. I, I think that the best, the best uh, um, uh, present I lived in my life yeah. at that point. I'll ask you a, a last question and uh, it's about, uh, it's uh, a bit provocative, but perhaps it will uh, stop. Yes. Uh, yeah. Are you Zionist? Zionist. Are you a Zionist? I am, Zi I am not Zionist. I, but at the same time, I, I am not anti-Zionist and not pro-Zionist for the re many reasons. The first reason, I don't want to live in a world without the Jews. I am very, very, in deep my soul, I am ultimate Jew. Ultimate Jew. Ultimate, ultimate Jew. So that I am against putting all the bowls, uh, all the eggs in one basket. Especially if the basket is the Middle East. In the Middle East, we live with the mentality of a tribes. The Middle East is not ripe yet to be a modern democratic society. Uh, and especially when our leaders in the morning, in the, in, at noon, at night, that they say they, that we are aliens in the Middle East, that we are European, we are uh, uh, defending Europe. We are part of U Europe. They don't know how in the Middle East hates the European imperialists because the uh, British imperialism, French imperialism, uh, even Italian, they, they do so much crimes in the Middle East. And we, when we declare that we are defending the um, uh, the, uh, 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 the culture and values of Europe for the middle, for a Jew, Europe still, I, I, I adore the culture of Europe, I, but I can't uh, 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 forget that Europe, it is also what did for us in Spain. Uh, Europe would, it was Hitler also. So that, so that that's the second thing. If if we, uh, as uh, as a state, find the way to be part of the Middle East, may, maybe we have the uh, the uh, possibility to live uh, as equals inside the Middle East, but. Um, out of uh, feeling the, uh, the danger, I am I against bringing all the Jews 
inside Israel. That's one point. There are many other points. Uh, Zionism said at, the, at, uh, uh, at its start, b before coming to Israel, we have to create a new Jews. And my question is, what is the, ro the wrong with the old oh, Jew? I don't be uh, I don't be the new Jews. Why? Because some uh, and in some ways Zionism adapted the anti-Semitic uh, propaganda that the Jew is a crook, Jew doesn't uh, like to work, Jew, Jew, the Jew is parasite, and the, the Zionism adapted this point. We have. To, to, to learn from the others and to work hard. My father and my grandfather worked to, till their death very hard. So that, uh, 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 and because of that, I, I'm not Zionist, but I, if any, anyone wants to be Zionist, share all the Thank you very much. Thank you for everything some thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you.